Welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey guys, it's Debbie Potts, and I'm excited to talk to Dorian from Keto Mojo. Once again, I think he was on about a year ago, and we're going to talk about how to test and not guest and how to create your own bio-individual program to figure out what to eat, when to eat, to improve your ability to burn fat, and to improve your athletic performance. So if you are a low-carb athlete, or keto endurance athlete, we want to figure out what we can eat as an individual that doesn't spike our blood sugar up, but also we want to improve our metabolic flexibility so we are burning fat as our main fuel source and our carbohydrate fuel source is our backup tank, that emergency you know, go-to fuel to give you a little rocket fuel end of a workout. It also depends on the intensity of your workout. Are we doing a math, mafetone type of low heart rate and fat burning workout, longer duration. If you're doing a high intensity interval training called HIIT training workout, that fuel source will be a little bit different. You'll burn more carbs. So we'll talk about how to use Keto Mojo for athletes to improve that fat burning and metabolic flexibility. But also I want you to figure out how you can figure out what foods are best for you to eat because some foods may raise your blood sugar and keep you out of that ketosis. Now, I'm a big fan of nutritional ketosis. You don't need to have a lot of high ketones when we're just trying to be fat burners. So I'm good like 0.1, 0.5. You don't need a huge number for us that are healthier and exercising once or twice a day, especially triathletes, we're usually doing two workouts a day. So let's talk to Dorian and talk about Keto Mojo. Hey, you guys, I have Dorian on the show to talk about one of your favorite subjects, how to test and not guess if you are burning fat and how we can improve our performance. And of course, my favorite is longevity. <laughs> so I have Dorian back on the show. It was about a year ago when you are on the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, and we got you back on today to talk about GK testing and more. Yeah, I mean, I think it was February. I mean, if you think what a different world we were we were in back back then uh, and, that, and now here, here we are uh, i'm you know i wonder a lot about how our keto tribe is is faring in the e era of covid when mm -hmm. so many uh you know the the risk factors are, are because of comorbidities are all because of high blood glucose obesity um people with metabolic syndrome mm -hmm. all of those things are the, the more likely ones to to have a, a challenge yeah. Um, so very interesting. I wonder how the studies will come on out on that one. I know you just started speaking of those subjects and it, I just feel like my, uh, cortisol level just went up because <laughs> it's what I've been talking about since March. And it's just like, you know, uh, we're never going to hear this from the media and it's our job on podcasts and blogs and social media to get this information out there. So have you found... Yeah. Any changes well, in your business make an impact? You know, initially we um, we found that I think everybody had that knee jerk reaction as to um, uh, during that first March of like what is going on, and there are some people who retrenched into their older habits, comfort eating, and, and things like that. But then we actually saw as as we as people realized what the new normal was, we actually saw a rebound and was better, um, uh, and people were like, oh, oh, wow. You know, maybe I really do have to um, look at my diet. Maybe I do need to uh, get my blood glucose um, down. You know, if you're if you're stuck at home and all that you can do is eat, then isn't it? There's not, there's not more really of a more perfect time than to be able to to take um, uh, control of yeah. your life. You know, you have this, you actually got that perfect moment that very few other people actually get in life. And it was how you utilize that. Yeah. You know, I you know, hear stories of people that had um, uh, young children uh, that they suddenly realized that they knew that their children were going to be growing up and to have this long period of time with them was actually quite beneficial that they might not ever get again. 
And so I, could, I still think in that way, some people were like, oh yeah, I, I do have time to do that. I don't have my commute anymore. Imagine yeah. when you, if you had a 45 minute commute every day and all of a sudden you could do that at home and be like, you just got 45 minutes of your life. You actually got 90 minutes mm -hmm. of your life again. What could you have done with that? And so I really did think people started to take another look at that. And especially when people like you are, are out there trying to spread this message. We do. Uh, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, I said from the very beginning. What is the gift in this? It's like a huge learning opportunity for the entire world that are you really healthy? And it's like, here's the perfect time of all times in our, our lives to take ownership of our health and take action. And it is simple little things that we'll talk about today, what we can do to improve our health. And that starts with our gut health and what foods we eat to balance our blood sugar and create a happy, healthy microbiome. And it's just shocking to me how many people didn't realize this or don't still don't know about it, that it's really blood sugar balance that we want to look at. Insulin resistance, obesity is one of the key factors for people that are having a hard time with COVID. And it's like, I started writing this immune system one one book back in March, like, all right, you know, you have this ability to fight it. Why don't we take this opportunity when you're stuck at home? <laughs> it's like you said, to start doing all this stuff. But anyways, we're here and it's, you know, this show will be out end of December, just in time for New Year's. So maybe it's that time of year that people need to really go, oh, New Year's resolutions. I need to yeah. start taking action now. And, you know, the vaccine doesn't work unless you have a healthy, re resilient, robust immune system. So yeah. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to do? It's well, and look, we've got a, there's a long time between now and a vaccine. Uh, let's be very kind of like clear with that. Yeah. Um, with the billions of doses that need to be done for the majority of the population, if you think about that, some people are saying, oh, it could be December. Uh, I think you're really going to kind of like see it as between now and May. But you can have a profound difference in your life in under 30 days. Um, in fact, for somebody who's got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you can actually do it in under 15 days by following a well-regulated ketogenic diet. And what I mean by that is the liver uses fat de novo. So if you're suddenly in a, in a state of nutritional ketosis, where is the first fat that's going to be used? Boom, right on the liver. And so you can reverse that in under 15 days, which I think is extremely powerful. I mean, Dr. Eric Westman said, you know, that a well-regulated ketogenic diet is prescription strength. Mm -hmm. uh, when you consider how uh, it can change. One of the biggest worries for Verta Health in San Francisco that is reversing the effects of type two diabetes is because it works so quick, they want to actually de-prescribe de-prescribed medications because it works so good. That's their biggest worry is of, of hypoglycemia is on an individual. And that's where they always are measuring glucose. Mm -hmm. Ketones help with compliance. Uh, the Verta study actually, if we could keep him on that, actually showed that they had 74% compliance of people following a well-regulated ketogenic diet. And did you know that 28% of people don't take their medications? So right. they had better compliance following a well-regulated than somebody taking a pill. And they had something like, I think it was 67% of people actually came off of all medications. Wow. You know, huge. they dropped down the insulin doses that they were doing by like, uh, I think it was almost um, like, uh, again, a, a large number, like almost 70% or something like that, which was, which was is a massive amount to, to reduce down. But you probably never hear that in the media, right? Because what's the alternative is the, the billion dollars loss of the pharmaceutical companies <laughs> supporting those people with insulin type two diabetes yeah. medications. Right. I mean, yeah, you should. It was funny. Um, I did a bit of guerrilla marketing about, way over a year ago, and we sponsored the uh, American um, Diabetes Association um, uh, Tour de Cure or Ride. And this was before the new um, um, president came on in, who is actually beginning to get go low carb. She is. And we kind of like were in there and we had sponsored the team and for California, we were the number one team. We had two at-risk riders on that who went through ketogenic coaching and cycling. And um, Jenny Priestley, who was um, the biggest fundraiser, she actually was able to reverse the effects of her diabetes and actually um, come off medications. And there we were in there. And the two biggest sponsors of that ride 
was Biorad, maker of insulin, and Jelly Belly, maker of glucose pills. Huh. Mind um, blown when I yeah. when I when I looked at that. And so the amount of money that is in this is 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 humongous. But the cool thing is, is everybody can be a radical with this because how you spend your money, what foods you buy, will have a market forcing function that can ultimately change the world. And what I mean by that is if we start shopping the outer, outer aisle, you know, good fresh vegetables, yeah. good quality meat and fish um, uh, products, high quality dairy that we're gonna bring into it and leaving that garbage that is in the middle of the, the, the morgue, if you will, that is a supermarket. When we start doing that, we will actually change the farming paradigm globally. And my ultimate goal is, is that, you know, you see the work of what Nina Tyshops is doing with the mm -hmm. Nutrition Coalition, is how do we change the guidelines, the USDA guidelines, because if you can change that, you can actually change the farm bill. Because mm -hmm. in America, we are subsidizing obesity with the application of cheap carbohydrates that we are washing. And I think that's it. And by doing that, yeah. we can change the metabolic health of the, of the nation. You know, I, you know, everybody's worried, right? We're in the second wave that is coming on in. Flu season is coming on in. Mm -hmm. I have to say, since I've been ketogenic, my incidences of flu have diminished absolutely significantly. And the effects of them are far less. And there was actually, mm -hmm. I think, a, 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 a thing in Cell Magazine on, they, they did an example in mice, and they showed that they reduced down the effects of that. So if we can boost our immune system, if we take away our, the, each of the chances of having a problem, then that leaves us to have a much longer and better health span. Mm -hmm. Because that is what we're about. You know, like I, I know Dave Asprey wants to live to 140 and like, <laughs> go for it, mate, I'm behind <laughs> you all the way. But for me, it's sort of like, how do we live that health span? Yeah. Instead of the, the long goodbye, what I call it the long goodbye yeah, when you true. when you see people that over a 15 or 20 year they don't have quality of life now they're certainly mm -hmm. propped up by the medical advances but they don't have that quality of life that vitality of, of mm -hmm. uh, being amber I mean I was reading some some stats just the other day 4,000 people a day are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes what a day that's sad. a day that's 4,000 wow. people that get, get a diagnosis every single day and once you've got a type 2 diabetes diagnosis that means 15 years less life to you oh yeah you know that for it. then 350 people a day get their leg amput is an amputation because oh. of diabetes 350 and even worse than that is about 150 people plus our end stage renal failure. Mm. So you, you look at that and you think about that. When somebody says, you look at me and says, you don't eat carbs, like I'm a seven headed hydra. I think having a leg amputated is atrocious. I mm. think having blood taken out of a body is diabolical. Mm. And early people dying because all they would have to do is change to say, what did I have? maybe a little bit of steak with mushrooms that have been sauteed in a little bit of bacon fat and a side of broccoli rub with a drizzle of olive oil and red pepper flakes. Yeah. And suddenly somebody's going to say to me, you're weird because you're in a state of nutritional ketosis. And by yeah. the way, I'll probably wash that down with a really nice shin on from the Loire Valley. And, and people will say, you're, you're really restricted. You're on a diet. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I'm actually on a lifestyle. And yeah. that lifestyle is tasty and delicious and enjoyable. And I feel great. My skin's great. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's everything's better, but it's, it is, it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle and it's a choice. And it's always shocking to me that just choosing, you have a choice what to eat, hopefully <laughs> that you can mm -hmm. choose good. You have an option to get access to real food but people go to the quick and easy food. I mean, you look at the drive through lineups, <laughs> just how long they are. And I tell you, a quick and, e and, the quick and easy one that my wife and I love to do, we just take those little cauliflower rounds, 
Uh-huh. We put a, a bit of cheese that is on, on that. We bung it in the microwave for about 30, 30 odd um, uh, seconds. And we can either sprinkle it with some sort of arugula on it. We can put some s- sausage on it, like a little mini pizza or something like that. And you're done. And you've got it done within two minutes. And, yeah. And it's and, most, Simple. and also most of the time, if you're ketogenic, you don't need to be eaten three times a day. No. That's I haven't I had lunch, haven't had breakfast, and I'll do one really nice meal a day mm-hmm. and spend time over the cooking of it. So you actually free up more, more time in your day by being Not a well-regulated kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was working today, and it was like suddenly 12 o'clock, and I hadn't eaten yet. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I just can't believe it was already after 12, and by the time I got something to eat, it was 1 o'clock, and I just yeah. had a little something because I still don't have time to eat my – meal which i'll eat at four o'clock in between stuff but it is just so easy and i i try to show that my low carb athlete instagram and my facebook low carb athlete page just show here's simple meal i'm a horrible chef and i'm just simple my husband does the fancy stuff on the weekends (laughs) and it's just so easy but i think it's confusing for athletes they think that what you hear a lot about ketosis is confusing and we'll talk about how we can test and, and not mm-hmm. guess if we're in ketosis and what we need to, what range we should be at. But for athletes that are exercising, endurance athletes, especially and triathletes who are doing one or two workouts a day, you know, that they can do some carbohydrates in their vegetables. And I think a lot of people yeah. think zero so, carbs. Well, it's talking about zero carbs and athletes in endurance. Did you hear about the zero five hundred with Dr. Ian Lake uh, in the UK? No. So this is amazing. Um, uh, Dr. Ian Lake, he's a type one diabetic. He's sp- spoken at many low carb conferences, uh, a personal friend of Gemma and I. And um, we met him at Bogun Live in Switzerland. And we met him also in, in England. And he was a doctor, uh, he's a GP, and he had followed all of the guidelines and could never get his A1C down to what was the required amount. And he's a doctor, he should know how to do it. So he went low carb and he actually found out that he could finally get control of his A1C, he could bring it down, didn't get any hyperglycemia like that, and was and dropped the amount of insulin that he was taking by about 40%. So being a kind of like a uh, guy, he decided that what he wanted to do was um, uh, run the length of, um, of England from Lands End to John O'Groats, um, uh, doing it low carb and keto. And he was tracking his ketones all the time. And he was tracking his glucose. Well, then he got to about 600 miles and his knees gave out more than really um, uh, his, go figure. <laughs> his type one on, on that one there. But that was his first journey. But then he really just recently wanted to take it to the next level and really kind of like show what the human body could do. So he put together this this 0500 and basically it was no food, five days, 100 miles with a team of athletes and one of them was an Olympian as well. Mm -hmm. Two people with um, type ones and the doctors and fully supported in that respect. And they got up every single day and did 20 miles, zero food. And they said that their recovery was incredible. Think about that. Their recovery was incredible. Every day they actually felt good. Why is that? Ketones are muscle sparing. Ketones reduce down inflammation in the body. And look at how far they could go for five days on that. Yeah. Plus that to me is just like if you're talking about the endurance athlete, right there is where we have, look at what Zach Bitter can do and, yeah. and, the, and the Western States run. Uh-huh. You know, why are all of these athletes training low carb? Yeah, you can pulse in glucose at any time, but a glucose burner can find it really difficult to pulse in mm-hmm. enough ketones without having disaster pants occurring because your, your body can actually produce far more ketones than you could possibly ingest. Yeah, that's a whole other topic, taking taking ketones. I haven't done that, but I know my f- friend does that in her workouts, and it is uh, another subject. But it's like what Peter Atia did for years ago, same thing. It's like I can bike how many miles he would do and, and just have the chicken bullion cubes and just have that water and then get that sodium electrolytes. But I, I find it easier to exercise fasted because I can't eat and work out, so it's really 
make sense to me to just do minimal and then have your meal afterwards. But I don't. I would, I would be very intrigued when you say that you like to work out fasted as to whether or not the, this is just, just talk, talking off the top of my head here, generally my key times are lowest in the morning mm -hmm. and they raise up during the day to the afternoon and into the evening. So if I was at my zenith uh, late afternoon, would that be better for me timing my workouts in that later afternoon bit when I would have had maximum amounts of ketones that would be available to my body rather than the other time? I mean, here's certainly when testing could be better. I mean, I used to test before and after yoga. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like if I test it afterwards, you know, because you're definitely going to see your ketones come on down um, uh, because you're, you're using them. Mm -hmm. And so if I had, you know, more left in the tank, like if I finished my yoga and I had like still 1.7, you know, I could have pushed faster and harder. I should have been, mm -hmm. I should have dropped off on the ketones. And then what I do is then see, I see the, the post-workout bounce where your liver is still going, oh, well, I need to give you more energy mm -hmm. here. So it's, I find that I always found that post um, workout yoga um, bounce to be a little, little cool in, in that respect. Hmm. Yeah, that's what, you know, I wanted to talk was on my list of questions is talk about, you know, testing to figure out when is the best time to exercise when you are burning the most fat. And I tend to be able to work out in the morning best because I like getting up, do yoga and then go for a bike ride or a run. And then I swim at lunchtime. So it's always figuring out, okay, what can I eat that... I can't eat before exercising because I don't digest it. It's, you know, you're just regurgitating it. So it's easier <laughs> to not have anything and just have some water and electrolytes beforehand. But, you know, it's, it's figuring out how to measure when we are burning the most fat or when is the optimal time to exercise and as well eat for the yeah. day. So is that, you know, talk about the GK plus and how that's going to help us figuring out what? Yeah. So okay. with the GK plus, we um, uh, we added some new enhancement into the actual meter itself and on to um, onto our app. So um, obviously, you know, as as most of you guys are um, uh, familiar, this is this is the new the new meter that we um, um, that we have going on there. It's pretty hard to see on the screen now. Mm -hmm. I'll do my Come best. Right here. And uh, and then we also have that interlinked um, uh, with with the app. And uh, the, which I have, okay. uh, yeah, you got it. And so, uh, what we can do now on the app is we in, added a tagging function. So any reading you can now tag it with anything that you like: pre-workout, mm -hmm. post-workout, if you were swimming, whether or not you were running, what, whatever that it is. And so, you can um, now, if you wanted to, to sort by those actual readings and this will start to give you instead of getting lost in the noise of like this was my baseline in the morning this is my measurement before i started my run this is my measurement after so you can you can sort, sort of like just say hey i want to look at all of my running measurements and let's see what happened you can then add a note in there just to give you uh, an example of what was your performance like on that run uh, uh, and so here you can now use data driven outcomes like how did i feel and like were you was there a certain um uh, piece that you you did better at like are higher ketones better not necessarily because what we measure is is, is in the tank um, but we don't say how well your liver can produce ketones or how good your mitochondria is at receiving it mm. and so you've got to do some inferences uh for that which i think is is kind of in interesting because if you think about it you know, it takes a while that, you know, what, what Zach Bitter was able to do when he did the Western States run was work his metabolic edge. Uh, Peter Tia has spoken about that. Is that how hard can you work and still not draw down so that your, your liver is able to metabolize the fat that is on your body or any of, of the fat that you're ingesting and turn it for energy. Now, but if to you keep it up with your exercise to match it. Right. right. And that energy level can change over time as your and um, the ability to receive it changes over. You know, Follick and Finney said on their faster study that it took 12 weeks for uh, uh, an athlete to get it fat adapted. I, I would posit it actually takes a lot longer. I think athletes can really start to work that low carb edge 
to achieve far greater things. Uh, you can see that how Zach Bitter's records seem to get more and more and better and better. Was that because he became a better runner? Wouldn't that be somebody who was younger should have got that? Yeah. No, he was able to over a period of time work his metabolic edge. And I think for endurance, this, is, this will be really fascinating to see. Um, how you can get to the, to the edge of that. I think also lactic testing is definitely something that we should um, uh, take a look at in the future as well. Maybe one day I might even bring that in uh, uh -huh. as because I think that that ability to keep the lactic acid down and to, to work at higher um, uh, endurance levels will be, will be a pretty cool thing. You mentioned mitochondria and that always sparks an interest in me as an endurance athlete. You know, I was trying to perform my best and get my health to where I want it. But it's, it's always that word as we get in our middle age range <laughs> to optimize our mitochondria. If we want to burn fat, health and performance gains that we should be working on how we can get the mitochondria to work better and the liver health. So do you have anything kind of, to, you mentioned that, just how we can really figure out how to. Yeah. I mean, if you think out. about mitochondria, it's, it's, it's the, it's the battery of the cell. Mm -hmm. And if, and mitochondria play a massive, it's a power plant within the body. And if you take a look at, I, I think I'm going to have, I'm not going to quote a percentage off the top of my head that is wrong here. But Dr. Nasha Winters, on the last time that I heard her speak, was talking about the percentage of the body that is mitochondria is a massive mm -hmm. amount. I mean, when talking massive, we're talking very high percentages, like 80 or 90, because it's in every single cell. Yeah. It, is, it, it is what you need to transfer the energy. And hold on, if you can change yourself at the cellular level, whoa. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm all into it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's why, you know, that's why I do fasting. Like, like how do I, through apto, uh, apoptosis and autophagy, how can that make mm -hmm. a difference? And, and then this is how meters can actually help you with those things. The first thing is, you know, I do a baseline so I understand what my morning is. That's usually my lowest ketones. Mm -hmm. Glucose is fasted. I'm looking like today was 87 that I wanted there really good ketones when I test, I had to test my life for another podcast and I had 2.5 on my ketones. I was like, wait, wow. I'll take that. It, it's very <laughs> strange since I've added more, um, I, I, we, we started pulsing in some longer, longer fast. Um, uh, like we went from two days to three days to four days and we did wow. five days. And I've had a real echo from these five day fasts and then moving into really one meal a day. And, and, uh, and I'd say one meal a day, but it's a more of a fat fast. I do have a little bit of cream in, in, my, in my tea that I sip on during the day. So it's not a full classical fast, OMAD, but that's kind of like where I am. And now I've found that my ketone levels are, are, are holding at this higher area. And you know my mood's better. And I always was between 1.1 and 1.7. That's when my mood was, I found myself the best before. Because uh, yeah. I was an antidepressant for many years, and now I'm not on any medication. Uh, so this really has, for me, is, is sort of like been a change by adding these longer day fasts. But what I found was like, you know, you get that pack of dog rings a bell around about noon or around about five o'clock. You know, it's time for it's time for a glass of wine, and you're like, you're in a fast. And then you find yourself reaching for the for the refrigerator, and you're like, then I go like, hold on, am I really hungry? Uh -huh. Because fasting is not only a physiological game, but it's a psychological game. And the psychological one is hard. So what I would do is I would prick my finger. I would look at my ketones. Now, my ketones are normally 1.1 to 1.7. And suddenly I've got 3.5 or, or 4. I've got, I'm a wash in energy. But my, so am, am I really hungry? No, you're not. And then you go, like, okay, I'm going to have a little bit of a seltzer water. I'm going to drink that, go back to my email. And then that wave pass. And that's how you can build those fasting muscles so you can pulse on in these, these more longer therapeutic fasts um, within the body to you know, get rid of those older organelles and, and start on new with the fresh. And you know, when you get into day three, you have this massive increase in human growth hormone, about 1,200%. Oh. Hold on here. If you think about this for an endurance person, you want to be replacing everything out because you know you, you're doing endurance. I mean, and like that, if you've suddenly got a twelve hundred percent increase in human growth hormone, mm -hmm. and then you suddenly pulse in a good workout, then 
uh, get swole. I mean, you've, you've got everything that you need. You break your fast, you, you increase the amount of protein that you've got that's going on here. You now have got a huge amount of growth hormone and you've got this regenerative piece that's in the body. Mm. That's, uh, the, I think Sin Man spoke about the eat, stop, eat method. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you know, that's powerful stuff. And a glucose burner can never do that. It yeah. Be able to do it, but a dual fuel, yeah. Well, Man, that's it. You know, I was listening to, I'll put the link in the show notes on your website for keto endurance athletes. And I think it is reviewing how the main focus should be fat as fuel source. And we want to become fat adapted because we want to have that dual fuel, which is metabolic flexibility. But do you want to add anything? Why that's so important for athletes to have that dual fuel or for everyone to have it? Yeah, I mean, there was a classic example. If you take a look at... um, uh, Tour de France competitors and look at the color bands at their drink bottles. You know, they, they play games with those color bands and each one of those color bands is going to have a, a different for- formula that is in it. So if they want to start to do a breakaway, you know, they've got a glucose, they've got a glucose solution that is going to be right in there. They're going to say, all right, we've got to do extended power right now. We've been on ketones for our endurance pass and that we've trained low carb, but you know, if you want to have sustained power over a longer period of time, ketones can only get you so far. Uh, and if you can, like we talked about that metabolic edge, but if you want to go over the metabolic edge, like an athlete might want to do, mm-hmm. that's when you can pulse on in glucose, if, if you will. But you, you've only got a finite amount of time, you know, so how you put the nitrous oxide press the nitrous oxide button, you know, you can only do that for a little, little while. And then, you know, it can be deleterious to you on, on yeah. that one, but they will, they will change that. But, you know, that is the, the challenge of, of trying to, um, uh, to, to pulse on the glucose. But if you're burning through the glucose at that time, you know, you're not going to have as much of an, a challenge, I think, to your insulin response. But I still think on that bit, there is, we see a lot of athletes in later life who were glucose burning and carb loading, who then have many different, you know, dying of heart disease and type two diabetes and pieces like that. So the, you know, the question is, is there is the, the athlete who wants to do it for health and then the athlete who wants to do it to the best of their, bit of their ability to get the records when that could even still be bad for that individual. Uh, you know, yeah. What, what, what are you going to do? You know, yep. uh, is the record worth it? I, I know. know. <laughs> you know that's why I always go back to the longevity. Cause I think another topic is for athletes as I speak about all the time is chronic stress. And when you're over training and how can yes. measuring your glucose and ketones help us maybe get some clues. I know heart rate variability would help, but can we use this to see any signs and symptoms of overtraining? If you change, I'd be curious to see if you can change. Certainly stress, much. stress and cortisol, um, uh, so it's, uh, that can eat, that easily shows up as mm-hmm. elevated glucose. Yeah. Cause if you're not uh, changing anything, you're not changing. Cause I wrote in my book, life is not a race. I was low carb. I was doing fasted workouts. I was eating a high fat diet, getting my protein, but I started to have, you know, HP axis dysfunction. So your cortisol levels are going up. So your blood sugars are going up. So I'd have, I got insulin resistance from nothing to do with what I was eating or my exercise because I was doing very efficient at burning fat. I was tested, but that's my story. I I was going to share people since 2013. And that was this chronic stress impacts the whole you, even if you are doing low carb eating to balance your blood sugar. And and you'll see that as, as a trend. A lot of people fixate on N equals one, you know, they look at one data point. And so if, if you're really looking to start getting targeted, you're going to be looking for these, these trends. Are you in a period of elevated stress where your numbers are, are, are a lot higher? You're, you're in, you know, faster in the morning, you're in the mid nineties and maybe even in, into the hundreds. And you're like, well, why is, why am I in that? Now, ideally you, you want to have a blood glucose of 83, but there's always variability on meat. I mean, uh, uh, in vitro diagnostics is kind of like archery. You know, the strip is your arrow, the meter is the bow, the control mm-hmm. is, is the target, and obviously that's you, the archer. How you conduct your test 
how do you make sure you've got your hands clean and the amount of time between the tests because the air is the enemy of blood, just like it is of wine, um, the speed and all of those things that can, can factor up getting a, a really dial on in a nice um, measurement. So you've got to add what is the normal fluctuation of percentage points. But if you're seeing this elevated trend, and then perhaps one evening you get a get a great night's sleep. You went to bed early. You weren't on your on your phone um, uh, late at, at night. You were blocking your, your blue eye. Blue got your blue eye blockers on there. So you put that down and you've got none of that. And suddenly you start to see these numbers come down. You know your, your your yoga got into place. Your breathing started to come there. You got that stress out, and you start to see the blood glucose come down. So it can be very very telltale um, uh, in in that respect. And also on that, when we talk about sleep, you know, ketones actually help sleep, mm -hmm. but not to begin with. Um, anybody who's new and just starting, I can tell you, you're going to get some freaky deaky dreams on ketones when your brain is suddenly has been in this glucose world, suddenly gets ketones that it hasn't been used to. Um, I mean, like it fires up. I mean, we know that um, ketones can help um, for epilepsy for over 30 years. It can reduce down the seizures. That can, it can assist with perving the brain after traumatic brain injury. Uh, it can protect from, you know, it was Dominic D'Agostino came up with exogenous ketones for divers, for um, um, especially for SEAL teams, so they could reduce the effects of long duration dives and getting seizures. So suddenly you get all of these ketones and you're like, whoa, this is... It's amazing, but then after a while, it, it kind of like settles down. Uh, I find it fascinating that ketones can easily cross the blood brain barrier, but glucose needs a GLUT1, GLUT2, or GLUT3, or GLUT4 transporter. It needs a ship to take it over. So, is glucose actually our default fuel if you think about it that way? Yeah. If you need a ship to get you across the water, <laughs> or you could just wander through that water, no problem at all, as if it's nothing. What, what, what do you think is the, is, is the default that we will have there, that, that ease of transport? And ketones is that. I mean, that's why I've been ketogenic since 2015. I mean, when I mean, you look at the data set, it's like, well, what if we've only had the rise of carbohydrates in the last 10,000 years? You know, the only yeah. reason why we have so many carbohydrates is for conquests of other nations. It's, it's so the breadbasket of Mesopotamia could go to war and had a shelf-stable product. Does that mean that that product is actually the best for the optimal self. Mm -hmm. That was actually one of our first modules in the nutritional therapy practitioner program I had years ago it was the history of the, the food industry and kind of that here's what changed and you can just look back and see when they started making the sugar and the wheat and all the, the increases of health issues <laughs> kind of correlate with that. Yeah. But, I think one thing I just want to throw in, you know, this chart that people can get on the website, mm -hmm. optimal glucose zones, you mentioned what we should strive to be in and then optimal ketone levels. Now N equals one, of course, but we talk about bio individually in FDN practitioner work as well as nutritional therapy. And, and what do you find is, you know, if people are athletes, they are healthy. They don't need to be necessarily in set nutritional ketosis as like one to three, what is your kind of thoughts on that for athletes and where the optimal ketone zone should be? Yeah, you know, we agonized over that diagram because we'd all seen kind of the um, the Volica and, and Finney diagram, which was how they showed 0 0.5 as being the edge of nutritional ketosis or nutritional ketosis after 0 0.5. But we have actually seen some, out. some <laughs> athletes um, <laughs> be maybe the 0.4s, maybe the 0.3. So you'll see yeah. that there's that blending of that edge there. Luis Vilsenar of Keto Gains was one of the more better recorded cases where he kind of said, don't go chasing ketones, chase results. You know, there like is that. a data point. For many years, my wife Gemma was 0.3, 0.4s. We were eating exactly the same foods and I'm like dancing around going, I'm 1.1, I'm 1.7, pitch up, look at me, you know, like... <laughs> And, and it, that's completely wrong because, she, like we said, we only measure what is in the tank. You can have somebody who's efficient at creating ketones and efficient at using them within the mitochondria. But after we did lots of conferences and doing one meal a day at a conference, because, you know, your, your classic FOMO, <laughs> fear of missing out or meeting people <laughs> like yourself, you know, like who's going to wander by? You, you yeah. started fasting more and Gemma's metabolism changed. 
even after many years, you know, sometimes wow. a, 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 a switch can get, get flipped and now she, she's at more elevated levels. So it, it, it can really adjust over a period of time. So on that, we've done like two kind of light zones. We say that there is, you know, nutritional ketosis for most people, 0.5 to about three. You know, that, that, that lower level is fine. And you know that if you're trying to be in like a therapeutic zone for mm -hmm. epilepsy or for maybe for a cancer, if you're undergoing cancer, then you're going to strive to really get these higher ones and try and really push down your glucose as much as possible. So you can get that GKI in. And by the way, we are, we now automatically calculate on the app, your GKI if you do glucose and ketones within a very short period of time with each other. Because I find that the GKI is a really st more stable number when I, when I see it over time, especially my, my fasted one in the morning. And I, I, I tag that, that that's my morning um, uh, one so I can watch my GKI measurements. And I, I can tell you, when, when I've been drinking too much wine, oh, I watch my GKI come up. You know, normally it's about, you know, I'm averaging about 2.5 at the moment, but then I kind of like too much wine and I, I kind of like start getting the fours and the fives and the sixes and it's sort of mm -hmm. like, no, 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 Dorian, <laughs> you know, you get getting that biofeedback to work out what your carb edge is. You spoke about right. introducing some carbs into people's body. Uh, and my thing is like, what is your carb edge as an athlete? Is mm -hmm. it 20 grams? Is it 30 grams? Is it 40 grams? Is it 70, 100 grams? Yeah, Think about you don't that. know. Once you start to learn and see what the carb edge is, you know, are you gonna sweat the sweet potato? Maybe not, certainly not carrots. You know, yeah. then these more foods become available to you. Uh, I'd like to see more data sets of how people perform, maybe doing cyclical uh, ketogenic diets. You know, mm -hmm. will, does that work for some? Some people say yes, some people say no. Were we naturally designed to have cyclical carbs because the blueberries came into um, uh, in, in that brief season? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I find it's more sustainable. I used to be so strict and, you know, I grew up even high school dieting, doing the soup diet and this diet. So for me, did you do the cabbage soup diet? Yes, my I did. wife did. It was horrible. <laughs> First of all, your, your kitchen stinks of cabbage and then your wife stinks at the same time. So yeah. like, I'm like, don't do that, guys. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was in high school. I remember doing that and I had my mom put it all in the freezer and so I, I have a history of dieting as a, in my teenage and college years. So when I tried to, you know, go low carb is easy because it's sustainable because you're not hungry. And, but then if you're too strict of doing zero carbs as vegetables and, and figure out when time. So I find it best for me because I work out a lot longer on the weekends as, and you know, ex triathletes still do long bike rides on Saturdays and longer runs. And then we'll do maybe yoga, but then we can, I can still be in showing some ketones on the meter if I have some carbs, like, you know, cauliflower pizza crust or something on a pizza and right. different things. But it's, I think, important to experiment, as you're saying, to that bio individually N equals one and not make it feel like you're just super strict that you don't keep on it. But then right. again, there's that flip side that if you're just starting out, Yes, you need to be strict for that 30 days or however long until you have that fat adaptation process built up and you are metabolically flexible, but you don't know that unless you're testing, which is why yes. I'm a big believer in your product. I mean, and, and, and like, I, I want to be the first guy I sell a testing meter, but if we've done our job correctly, after a period of time, you really you test a lot to begin with as you learn your body, you learn your bio-individuality. And the need to test before and after meals diminishes then it's sort of like testing for performance and what mm -hmm. you're trying to achieve with your performance yep. uh, if people are you know just they're just into, interested in, in their metabolic health then my goal is you shouldn't need to test once you've learned your body because you know what food does for you we're, we're quite often creatures of habit but then there is the curiosity and then there is the you know, the, the more data-driven athletes who are really trying to, to work out where they want to get on, on that metabolic edge, where testing certainly comes on in. And the ability now to, for us to be able to tag and to yeah. put notes. And, you know, we built a secure, HIPAA-compliant, encrypted health cloud that's now on two continents in, in Europe of, uh, for the GDPR compliance and in America. And now we're beginning the process of interconnecting 
other platforms like oh. Chronometer, Biocanics, Heads Up Health, NutriSense, um, and the list kind of like goes on. And then we're actually trying to do even with, with doctors into their electronic health record systems. Mm. Because I really do believe that with data driven outcomes, mm -hmm. can you imagine what we have? We, we have real time telemetry. Now, many EHR systems, many hospitals aren't even geared up to get real-time telemetry, yet they use it in their ERs, but they don't use it for their patients. Think it's about crazy. That. Yeah, Imagine, missed, you, know, you should have your healthcare professional to say, I want, a, I want a list of every person's blood glucose today that's over 140 because they are most at risk. And if yeah. that person's been tracking their food using something like chronometer, they've got the macros, mm -hmm. then they can take that data and with basic AI, they could say, hey, Jane, we'd like to let know that we're concerned about your blood glucose today. And we noticed that in the last 24 hours, you've eaten these foods and some of them are flagged. That's behavioral change. If you want to change somebody, you have to change their behavior. That's how a meter can have massive amounts of power. It's this behavioral, it's the psychological. Physiological is relatively easy. Our bodies are very flexible. Psychological, it's hard. You know, uh, that cold rainy morning when you've got to get out and you've got to do your workout, you know? Yeah. That, but that is the hard part. But that's why I, my business now is just focused on the a comprehensive health program that's building your health up from the inside out, running the functional lab tests, using Keto Mojo, using nutritional therapy analysis, and putting all this information together because we can collect so much data now. It's amazing, like using DNA Fit, using different programs. And I have people use training peaks, which you need to get connected to as well. So athletes, when we're writing their schedule out, they can track the key emojo in there. But it's, if really people have to be motivated and ambitious individuals to do all this. And I think a lot of athletes are, but they need to know that, that edge as well as their carb edge, but how much is too much as I talk about metabolic chaos in, or FDM practitioner work, how much are you doing is causing too much stress and how's too little causing deficiencies, but it's everything that Goldilocks effect to really optimize the whole you from the inside out. And, and you know, and you, you've just summed up in that one moment there, <laughs> how important a good quality coach is. You're the tip of the spear. We just provide a data point, mm -hmm. but it's a, a, people's ability to interpret those data points and they get yeah. too much caught into absolutes. They get too much caught up in sometimes, you know, it's like data is good, but you know, the garbage in, you'll get garbage out, but interpreting the data for your actual personal use becomes an acting on that, you know, test, assess, address. You've got to be able to assess what's going on yeah. and address it. Like, why are you seeing elevated blood glucose levels in the morning? Have you got stress in your life? Have you managed to remove that away? Are you getting more vitamin D? Uh, are you getting that more sunshine that's coming into play? Mm -hmm. Are you in an area where there's more toxins in your environment that is going to, you know, we can upregulate and downregulate our epi epigenetics um, mm -hmm. to biohack ourselves. Um, and this becomes how the quantifiable self, how we can get, you know, my grandmother lived to 96 years of age. Wow. She was old school. She had a tub of lard in the, um, uh, in, in the in, you know, that she kept in the refrigerator. She actually put lard on toast, which I wouldn't recommend, but that, you know, <laughs> she's one of those, those types. We grew up with fresh food every single day mm -hmm. and she lived to 96. And so I wondered to myself, if I know I've got some of that genetic code there, yeah. what will my health span be like? In her later years, she wasn't ambulatory. She wasn't able to move around. She sat in the chair. And so her world came on down a little bit. But then we've also seen 96 year olds, you know, that are still out there, still walking mm -hmm. around and still trying to be as vibrant. They might not have been as quick as they were in their 30s, but they're still doing it. And this is what we need to head for. And, you know, I'm looking forward to having 30, 40 years of data. And perhaps my N equals one will be far more important uh, yeah. than the Framingham study that is used in, on nurses where they fill out a questionnaire to say, what did you eat last year? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what I ate last week. <laughs> 
Right, and now this is the basis of epidemiological science to say this is why we should eat that way. I mean, yeah. it is the world's worst piece of science and everybody can find correlation to say this is why you should have these pieces. It's not data driven. And I think this will be the new frontier on how we will move uh, science forward in personalized medicine. Data driven, that's for sure. And you know, people should get their insulin levels checked with their doctor as well as vitamin D, which should be essential to get, you know, fasted, fasted glucose, but are you doing insulin and the vitamin D and their inflammation markers? But <laughs> you yeah. have to ask. <laughs> yeah, fasted glucose, if you're testing on a regular basis, you can get an A1C equivalent just by looking at the last three months of your, of, of your data. Yeah, that's and, true. You know, it's, you know, I, I can, uh, why, why should I have to pay for an A1C if I've already, if I've already got it like that? Yeah. Let's have a look, last oh, 12 weeks. <laughs> I'm gonna go on to that one there. So, you know, if I look on the last quarter, you know, I'm roughly around about 92. Brilliant, there you go. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. No, no problem, that's, that's usually because I've been tasting at odd hours during the day. If I took that and then look at my fasted in the morning, it'll, it'll come on down like this morning being 87 was perfect. Mm -hmm. So I need to, we need to wrap it up. I know there's so much more to dive into because I know using FDM practitioner work, we're doing the Dutch test, for example, hormone and correlating that with this information. Also microbiome testing, food sensitivity, zoomers as with vibrant wellness. So it's fascinating to, I love being this health detective now and investigating all this information. You can see, all right, you know, your blood sugar. And I did do NutriSense for two weeks and that's why, you know, I really appreciate this because not everyone can, afford that information it's good 14 days and you don't get as you're saying you know you can connect it on the app but you're getting the ketones from your product but it's not something you know sustainable to do a continuous glucose mantra for everyone so this is more affordable and you can get the glucose and the ketones and yeah, the combination if, if you think that when we first started when i first started back in 2015 ketone strips were four dollars then when we launched yeah. in 2017 and got the price down to one dollar it's now with the new gk plus we dropped the price by another 20 percent and ketones are 80 cents direct from our, our um a website we do a combined gk plus combo pack which is ketones and glucose available on amazon it, it's a 60 of each so it's 120 strips and we're now down to obviously 50 cents when you combine that together mm -hmm. our goal is by by getting harmonizing europe and america together we can begin to lower that cost curve over time yeah and with that right. we become more affordable to more nations and more countries that can change their health yeah. And that to me is the most important piece is to, to affect outcomes globally. Love that. That's such a good, you're passionate and following, you know, your mission your, is based on your, your passion and purpose. So it's just great to have that drive and hopefully we can all work together to create impact in the world because we sure need it right now. And just all of us people in this community really need to team up and fight against the uphill battle towards the political nutrition and all the, other stuff behind it because <laughs> yeah. the media is not going to tell you this information so everyone please share this episode and get everything in the show notes and what else can we find Dorian will add in the show notes but next year 2021 just right around the corner anything mm -hmm. we want to share any challenges or things that we can get people to do for new year's resolutions well it's a new year it's a new you but remember that always <laughs> tomorrow is another day and don't yep. put off tomorrow what you can begin today is, is the way that i like it and only the individual is the agent for change nobody's going to do it for you can you right? quote yeah. that that could be your infographic <laughs> well you know it, it, it's really easy to be fat and unhappy but to, and nothing is good as healthy feels, you know, I, and I still, when I look at my face in the mirror and I, and I th this is, this looks so different to me, mm -hmm. you know, cause when I was 207 pounds and all I did was keto and yoga, you know, for me, it's, it's a real deep, profound change the, the mental clarity that comes on into play, the, that joie de vivre that you could, you can take on the world. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this is huge and i think 2020 if if you want to do that new year's relation it's like i think 2020 is going to be a fantastic uh, year i even think 2021 i even think 2020 wasn't too bad people got time <laughs> to spend with their families they, they learn themselves <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah and no i think it's huge benefits 
yeah. So it's going to be a good year. I'm Amen. To yeah, we're, I'm looking out to a palm tree. The sun is setting soon behind the Elfin Forest at our new house, but you two will have to come out and have a, a weekend away. Aren't you up in Napa? Or where are you guys? Yeah, we are up in Napa. We are actually, you know, f since the fires, we finally purchased a house after we lost our house in the fire. So we're here in, in Napa. It feels good to once more get out of a rental house and set down roots. And yeah. uh, it's been good. You know, change is hard. When you go through turmoil, it is hard. I mean, I've been through turmoil personally on myself um, uh, and then through obviously having losing a house of fire. And when you're in it, you're like, well, this is terrible. But when you actually get out the other side, you realize hold on, you sometimes get handed real, real opportunity. You've just got to know when to, to take advantage of it. And everybody has the opportunity to change their metabolic health. And you can do it one mouthful at a time. It is really, you're just going to change the way you shop. It's very simple. It's adequate fat, moderate amount of protein, lots of a bug around leafy vegetables. And you don't even need to use my meter. Uh, at the end of the day, you can Keep change your life that way. But you really want to dial it in? You yeah. really want to ratchet up? You really want to get the unicorns and rainbows? <laughs> okay, plus is the way to go. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, Dorian. We'll put all the links in the show notes. You guys can order your holiday gift for yourself and we'll start working on improving your health and longevity for the new year. So as yeah. you said, start now. Don't wait till don't the forget, perfect time. <laughs> don't forget to press like and subscribe in the link below oh, as yeah. every, everybody <laughs> says. <laughs> I never say that. So everyone push the link down below. Subscribe. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at DebbiePotts.net. You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.